Humans have always been fascinated by the moon. And why wouldn't we be? It's always been up there, cycling through our sky, influencing our beliefs and superstitions, shaping our perception of time, guiding us in our journeys. Our fate as a species has always depended on the moon. Quite literally. If not for the stabilizing effect of the moon, it's thought that the Earth's tilt may have swung wildly over billions of years, making the formation of advanced life impossible. That's how much the moon has shaped our past. We might literally not be here without it. But if NASA has their way, it could be just as important for our future. This is the third and final installment of my series on the Artemis program. The first episode was about the early robotic missions, the second was about the planned crewed missions. Today, we're gonna go beyond. Before we get into the meat and potatoes of this video, the rocks and regolith, if you will, I should start by acknowledging that a lot of this is speculative. Aspirational, even. Because as I say in the previous video, um, so far the Artemis program is only funded through Artemis V, which would actually be the second crewed moon landing around 2028. Fingers crossed. So yeah, as of right now, um, anything beyond the second moon landing is kind of up in the air. Actually, I say that, and as far as I know, that's still true, but actually just last month, NASA ordered three new Orion capsules from Lockheed Martin for Artemis 6, 7, and 8. So that's pretty cool. But still, future funding for this program is going to be uh, handled by a future government, one that will probably be dealing with an even higher level of dystopia than we're dealing with right now, so... Yeah. On the other hand, there's plenty of reasons to think that this could keep going. I mean, China and Russia have shown interest in their own moon bases, so if that competition heats up, I mean... Yeah, money, money could magically appear suddenly. I mean, also the continuing growth of private space companies could drastically reduce the cost of the, the missions to the moon and even create more opportunities around moon bases. Especially if we're able to successfully mine moon resources. Uh, and that could provide like an economic incentive to keep that thing going. Uh, covered that in a previous video. All that is to say that the further you look into the future, the more speculative it all becomes. Um, the point of this video is just kind of like to look at the possibilities based on the known plans that we have, but also just the overall program objectives. All right, with that in mind, let's pick up where we left off with Artemis 6. So, uh, yeah, if you do a search for Artemis 6, literally the only thing that comes up is a link to the Wikipedia page containing a list of Artemis missions, and it's just mentioned there. Um, it, it doesn't even have its own page. And it's just mentioned as proposed. So yeah, I can't really talk about any of the specific plans for Artemis 6 because they just, they, they don't exist at this point. Um, that's true actually for all the proposed missions from 6 through 10. But in general, if Artemis 1 through 5 was all about getting boots back on the moon and establishing the gateway, then 6 through 10 will be all about setting up a base camp and learning how to access and use moon resources. It's not going to look like much at first. It's going to be a while before we get a cool, you know, sci-fi looking moon base. But according to NASA Associate Administrator for Human Spaceflight, Kathy Luters, quote, On each new trip, astronauts are going to have an increasing level of comfort with the capabilities to explore and study more of the moon than ever before. Details are still sketchy, but what we can discern can be found in NASA's lunar surface sustainability concept. So the first few missions, maybe even up to Artemis 8, will have astronauts living in the lunar lander for increasingly longer periods of time, with rovers giving them wider access to the moon. Um, I'll get to those in a second, because they're pretty cool. And scattered about the area of the base camp will be various experiments, communications equipment, robotic rovers, and your power modules with solar panels and whatnot. All of which will be provided by the CLIPS program and private partners. Eventually, the plan is to land what they're calling the Foundation Surface Habitat, which kind of looks like a space station module that stands vertically. The design is still in the works, so any images are just concepts, but some show it with a solid metal hull, some look inflatable, but it's designed to house a crew of two to four people for up to 60 days. The design should feature space for crew quarters, exercise, a medical station, and storage, along with an airlock for EVAs. This would be the home base from which the crew would explore and experiment and build. And they would get around with the use of those rovers that I was talking about a second ago. Okay, so there's two designs that NASA's working on. The first is called the Lunar Terrain Vehicle, or LTV, because acronym. The LTV is a lot like the Apollo rover. It's an open air or open space platform with room for two to three astronauts with cargo. Except like everything in the Artemis mission, this is light years beyond what the Apollo rover had because not just will it be able to go way further, it can also function autonomously using some of what we figured out from the Mars rovers, I'm sure. So right now NASA's uh, soliciting designs for this rover, so it's still being pitched, but it's supposed to go up with the Artemis V landing, uh, which would be the second crewed moon landing. So it'll be up there a long time before the Foundation surface habitat. In fact, by the time that gets there, there could be a few rovers. But along with the surface habitat comes another rover, a far more advanced rover. This one is called the Habitable Mobility Platform. And the key word here is habitable, meaning astronauts can just live inside of this thing. 
It's a pressurized moon car. The whole point of the HMP is that astronauts can just climb inside of it and go for a ride, no suiting up and all the preparation that's involved with that. Ideally, the HMP would dock with the Foundation's surface habitat so crew members could just climb inside the HMP, undock, and get rolling. This will greatly expand the ability for astronauts to travel around the moon, make quick excursions, or take days-long trips to distant places. So that kind of sets up the base camp. Again, it's just nothing more than a habitat with rovers kind of shuttling astronauts around uh, to and from various experiments and study sites. But a lot of those sites and experiments are gonna be testing out the viability of using water resources that we find on the moon. So a lot of what takes place in this era of Artemis is gonna depend on how those early water hunts go. So I mean, in a best case scenario, the, the Viper mission maybe could actually find the water ice before anybody actually lands there. And then Artemis 3 could actually land close enough to sample it and bring it back. And then maybe by Artemis 5, we're already doing in situ experiments with it. Now, if that's the case, and we would be extremely lucky if that's what happened, um, you know, you might actually see stockpiling the ice and using it for, for habitation and fuel production on Artemis 6. You know, and then 7, 8, 9 could be increasingly longer missions, uh, setting up the foundations for a moon base. Maybe two missions could be simultaneous or, or have larger crews, and by 10, we're actually constructing a base. Or... <sighs> Neither Artemis 3 or 5 is able to actually get to the water. Or, or they find it, but they can't access it. Or they can access it, but there's some other technical hurdle that we haven't thought of yet. In that case, Artemis 6, um, maybe even 7 and 8, could still be working on that problem. It might actually be Artemis 10 before we actually get to use the water in any way. And honestly, I mean, by Artemis 10, we would have landed on the moon seven times, which is one more than we actually landed back in the 60s and 70s. So if we still didn't have the water and resources thing figured out at that point, um, I imagine the moon program will be in trouble. You know, at that point, the, 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 the novelty of being on the moon will have worn off and the, the reality of just how much money this program costs will be setting in with, so far anyway, no real pathway to a permanent settlement. In other words, it could possibly follow the same pattern as Apollo international competition notwithstanding. So yeah, when we're talking about Artemis 6 through 10, um, you know, that is one option. Total failure. <laughs> or, you know, we actually successfully learn how to access and use the moon's water in situ, and we're laying the foundations for a moon base. It's, it's one of those two. Since there's not really anywhere to go with the first option, let's focus on the second option. All right, so it's 2033, and Artemis 11 is being prepped to start a new phase in the program one where there's a permanently inhabited moon base. By the way, it, it is entirely possible at this point that there are private companies regularly flying around and maybe even landing on the moon, but we're here to talk about Artemis, so I'm just gonna stick with that. But I wanted to acknowledge that that is something that could be happening by then. It is also entirely possible that the SLS could be retired at this point, you know? Um, Maybe Starship becomes the ride, maybe it's something else, but I feel like that whole paradigm of how, uh, you know, the SLS is built and whatnot is, is, is kind of on the way out, but I could be wrong. Either way though, moon base. I really see the moon base as basically just the International Space Station sitting on the moon. So much of what we've learned over the last 20 years on the ISS will be applicable to living on a moon base. That whole, the whole system running in the ISS will just drag and drop onto the moon. What that moon base will look like and how it'll be built is a wide open question. Yeah, you know, sticking with the ISS theme, we could see modules delivered to the surface via something like the Dynetics lander, you know, where then the modules could be removed and, and then connected together on the surface. Um, basically an interconnected series of canisters. Some have even suggested that we could take one of the Starship lunar landers and then just turn it on its side and make that into a permanent habitat. Um, yeah, you would basically just, just tip it over and then remove the fuel tanks and turn the entire ship into a habitable volume and then just build out the interior, cover it up with regolith. I mean, it's an interesting idea. Um, feels a little janky to me personally, but it's, it's a good use of existing hardware. Um, I feel like it would require a lot of construction on the site that might be more challenging than some of the other ideas, but um, I, yeah, it, it's an idea anyway. The bit about covering it up with regolith though, that's definitely an idea that's being explored across several different moon-based designs. As you probably already know, people spending a lot of time on the moon are going to be subject to a lot more radiation and, and uh, cosmic rays than what we're exposed to here on Earth. I mean, even on the ISS, they're underneath that protective magnetic shield that we all have here on Earth. Uh, the moon inhabitants won't have that. We're going to need some kind of thick barrier if we're going to be spending a lot of time up there on the moon. And uh, yeah, I mean, the regolith is a really good uh, option for that. There's a lot of it there and um, it would do the job well. 
Some of the moon base ideas involve inflatable habitats that then get covered up with regolith or 3D printing on top of them with a mix of regolith and then some bonding agents. ESA is actually working on this with the famous architecture firm Fosters & Partners. In their own promotional video, they say the dome will house four people and take three months to fully cover the building using autonomous robots. The robots both scoop regolith, but also print it in a design similar to a bird's bone to ensure strength and lightweight qualities. There's even an idea of taking human waste and bonding it together with fungi to create essentially space poop bricks. I mean, I guess that's better than running a sewer line all the way back to Earth. Anyway, these methods are being tested in an ESA-built facility named Luna that actually just broke ground last year. Yet another option that might be a little bit further down the line is lava tubes. Yeah, the moon, way back in the past, had volcanic activity. Um, this is why there are so many various patches of darker colored rock across the surface. Or mare, as they're called. And all this volcanic activity left hundreds of lava tubes under the surface that could protect astronauts from all the space nasties. Um, and it might be a lot easier than, you know, 3D printing entire buildings. Currently in Hawaii, NASA scientists are studying the lava tubes there to see if they could work as homes. Also, by the way, I didn't even realize this, but the lava tubes on the moon are friggin' huge, like getting up to 3,000 feet in diameter. That's nearly a kilometer wide. And some of them have the same surface area as the city of Dallas. Probably not as much barbecue, though. I mean, it's kind of ironic. It's kind of interesting. You gotta, you gotta appreciate that ancient man once took shelter in caves, and here we are thousands of years later, we're, we're doing it again. It makes sense, though. I mean, we'd be using them for the same reason they did back then, just easy shelter. One other piece of infrastructure that NASA's working on that's worth mentioning is a communication network around the moon, or as NASA calls it, LunaNet. LunaNet is described as an extendable and scalable lunar communication and navigation architecture. Once LunaNet is set up, the robotic landers, rovers, and astronauts on the moon will have basically the same network access we have here on Earth. It'll be able to store and forward data to provide a Delayed Disruption Tolerant Network, or DTN, and the objective is to avoid needing to, you know, kind of pre-schedule data communications back to Earth. It'll also offer navigation services like a, a lunar GPS, maybe LPS, Lunar Positioning System. NASA recently tested a system like this in the most moon-like place they could find on Earth, Cleveland. I, I've never been to Cleveland. I don't know how many craters they have there. NASA's Compass Lab at Glenn, which usually specializes in abstract spacecraft and mission design, they used the lamppost infrastructure around Cleveland to sort of test out what a moon network could look like. The study found that attaching Wi-Fi routers to approximately 20,000 lampposts or other utility poles would help solve Cleveland's connectivity issues. And that by spacing these routers no more than 100 yards apart, the approach would provide around 7.5 megabytes per second download speed in a four-person home. Anyway, they're applying this data to build a network of nodes in orbit around the moon and on the surface with four main objectives. Networking, navigation, detection and information, and radio optical science services. Okay, so, um, at this point I could go on and speculate about all the kind of details involving a potential moon base, but ultimately, as you can read in pretty much any of NASA's literature around Artemis, the ultimate goal is Mars. Like, literally everything in the Artemis program is just a test bed for technologies that we can use to get to the moon, including using the moon as a refueling station. My question is, would it still be the Artemis program at that point? Like, would the Mars missions be Artemis 30 or something like that? Or would it be a whole new, whole new program at that point? I imagine it would be a new program at that point. What I could see happening is NASA handing off the moon industry to private companies and then focusing its efforts on a new program to Mars, kind of like what they've done, you know, in low Earth orbit to private companies now. You know, NASA kind of forges a new path and then private companies come in and take over the old stuff. I mean, again, especially if moon mining matures into a profitable industry, I think we'll be seeing a whole gold rush of, of companies going to the moon. And I still love the idea of an electromagnetic lunar mass driver that could send cargo and people from the moon to Mars. I mean, on one hand, the moon travels around the Earth at 2,288 miles an hour, so you've already got that going for you. You can just use that to slingshot stuff out to Mars. But then, if you put a mass driver on the moon with electromagnetic propulsion, um, you could travel, you could, uh, you could shoot it out at speeds that you couldn't do here on Earth because of our atmosphere and everything. And uh, you would require, like, far less fuel to do that. Once the infrastructure is in place to get parts to the moon and manufacture the parts there, which might actually be less energy intensive because of the 1.6 gravity, I don't know, I think there's something interesting there. But anyway, I, I, think, I think we've officially reached the end of what can be called the Artemis program at this point. So how much of this will actually happen? Who knows? I mean, like I said at the beginning, a lot of this comes down to whether or not we're able to access and use the water ice, um, what kind of international competition we have, and then just the overall economics of the thing. I think there are also good questions to ask about the sustainability of a moon presence. I mean, we know that there's a lot of water ice there, sure, but it's still a finite amount, and, well, human's gonna human. 
There's also concerns that all the landing and the activity around the moon could actually form a dust cloud um, because, you know, that stuff just doesn't behave the same up there as it does here. But this thing does actually seem to be happening, and that's exciting. Um, I am recording this early, a bit ahead of time. Uh, it's scheduled to go up on the same day as the new Artemis 1 launch window on the 14th. Um, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> I did the same thing with the last Artemis video, so... So you're either watching this right now and you're super all pumped up about the future of this moon program, or you're laughing at me. Again. But you know what? I'll just say what I've always said about the space program. It pushes our boundaries as a species, and the spin-off technologies that come from it, they benefit us here on Earth in a myriad ways. You know, one small example, there's uh, an aerospace manufacturer that manufactures parts for satellites and Mars probes and whatnot. They were able to take this precision machining capability and created a razor that's disrupting the shaving industry. I am, of course, talking about today's sponsor, Henson Shaving. Listen, you've probably been using cartridge razors like this to shave because you want the most advanced technology on your soft, squishy punum. I get it. And these cartridges are super advanced at taking your money each one of these cartridges costs like $2 each, and they actually don't even work that well because the blades aren't supported all the way across. So yeah, it might have 15 blades on it, but they're 15 blades that are bending and flexing all over the place and skipping across your skin because they're not supported. Plus it got all this plastic on it, so once you're done shredding your face with it, it just sits in a landfill for a thousand years. Compare that to the Henson razor, which uses old school double-sided blades that cost 10 cents each, and they're supported all the way across to a depth of only 27 microns. This means there's absolutely no room for the blade to bend and flex and bounce off your skin, and it's held at a perfect 30 degree angle, which any barber will tell you is the ideal angle for shaving. And yes, every single part of this razor is recyclable and sustainable. Yeah, I've been using this razor for about six months now, and um, I love it, honestly. I mean, I was a little hesitant at first because I never really used a safety razor before, but the learning curve is super small and the results are just like, I mean, incredible. Like, I, I really don't see me going back. Anyway, if you'd like to give it a try, just go to hensonshaving.com slash joescott, find a razor you like, and enter the code joescott at checkout to get this pack of 100 blades for free. Just make sure you add the pack of blades to your order. Seriously, this pack will last you like a year at least. I mean, th this will be the last money you spend on shaving until we land on the moon. Maybe not that one. So yeah, go check it out. I do think you'll like it. It's hensonshaving.com slash joescott. Link's down below. All right, thanks to Henson for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on uh, Patreon and the channel members who are keeping this channel afloat, forming an awesome community, just being really great people. I got to shout out some new members real quick. We've got S. Curtis Johnson, Ricardo Lopez, Hailstone, Imaginary Susan, Christian Z, uh, L.J. King, John Sefner, Seth Sefner, uh, Phil Rounds, Nicholas Denz, and Arthur Barbeau. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them, get early access to videos, access to exclusive live streams, and get a cool little button next to your name down in the comments, makes you stand out because you're important and you're special, uh, just click the little join button down below. Please do like and share this video if you liked it, and if this is your first time here, maybe click on this one. Um, it'll go back to the other ones. If you haven't seen the other Artemis videos, it'll go back to that. Um, and Or any of these down on the side that have my face in the thumbnail, go click them. And if you like them and you're not subscribed, I invite you to subscribe because I do come out with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for today. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.